Hi y'all and welcome back. I've thought a bunch of times about doing videos on the Two Penny Axe and the Parsons cause and I kept putting it off because I figured there are parts of Virginia and or colonial American history that most people have heard about before. Um, but then I decided it might be fun to do a deep dive into Richard Bland's pamphlet Inquiry into the Rights of the British Colonies and this kind of provides context for him. Um, that video will be posted soon, probably the next week or two. Um, I just have a little bit more work I want to do on that. But why does Bland have anything to do with the two penny acts, right? Well, he essentially authored them. He was the head of a committee in the House of Burgesses um, for addressing the effects of a drought they were having. And I'll discuss that more in a minute. But Bland had been outspoken for years about the rights of Virginia when it came to any laws impacting the internal workings of the colony. Um, so when he later wrote his inquiry, it was just the cherry on top of a lifetime of defending American rights. Before we jump into the video itself, I have a couple favors I want to ask of y'all. Um, first, check that you've hit like and subscribed. Um, this really helps the channel with YouTube's algorithm so more people see these videos. Plus, if you hit the bell next to the subscribe button, it's more likely that YouTube will notify you when I put up a new video. Um, second, if you could at some point when you're watching this video, let me know if you prefer I stick to lesser known topics or if you don't mind something like this where it's a common topic and I'm just doing my own research and kind of putting my own perspective on it. Um, I appreciate it, and it's really going to help me with planning out future videos for the channel. So, back to the Two Penny Acts. The first Two Penny Act was passed in 1755, and that was the one that was a response to a drought in Virginia. Um, it had severely impacted tobacco crop yields, resulting in an increase in tobacco prices. Unsurprisingly, right? Uh, normally, tobacco sold for about two pence per pound, but because of the drought, the price was said to have gone to six pence per pound. Um, meanwhile, the Anglican clergy in Virginia, they're paid in tobacco. And rather than the salary being set at a certain, you know, value in money worth of tobacco, it was set in pounds of tobacco. So if the price fluctuated, so did their salary. And this was during, you know, the the requirement to pay them in tobacco. That was set during a period when the price was fairly stable. Um, when the clergy saw prices triple, it, would, it looked like, they got kind of excited. And while they're looking for this potential windfall in their salaries, the economy of Virginia was looking at potential disaster because tobacco was, of course, a major, major part of the Virginian economy. Um, Thus, that committee, led by Bland, looking for a way to kind of ease the strain for that year. Um, and the measure was drafted to temporarily allow that clergy and other officials uh, who were typically paid in tobacco could instead be paid in money. And instead of that money amount being whatever the market value of tobacco was, they set that at two pence or two pennies per pound, which was closer to the typical rate. So there was nothing, you know, extraordinary that people were having to pay for a bill that, you know, was an ongoing expense, not something they could control for that year. Um, and this initial act of 1755, it had a sunset clause. So after 10 months, it was going to expire anyway. And, and this is really only passed to relieve that temporary pressure, right? Um, Lieutenant Governor Dinwiddie signed off on the measure as the king's representative in the colony, and the legislators thought that was that. Most clergymen didn't even protest, but, well, about a quarter of them did. Some complained to the Bishop of London, but their complaints were essentially irrelevant because the act expired so quickly before anyone in London could really do anything. Ironically, I'm not sure that tobacco actually sold as high as was expected that year. One journal article I read mentioned that the rate for 1755 to 56 wasn't actually that much more than the typical two pence per pound. 
And that's part of why few clergy bothered to, to even argue with it. Why? If it wasn't going to make that much difference. Um, I'm not entirely certain if, if that's true, because it's the only source that says that, and everyone else is talking about, you know, the six pence per pound as if that's what it actually went for. So I'm not in, entirely sure. Um, and for the purpose of this video, I think it's less important what it actually sold for, and more important how people reacted to uh, their potential gains or losses stemming from it. Now, in 1757, so about two years later, clergymen John Cam and Thomas Warrington, they petitioned the House of Burgesses requesting a salary increase. So they say that an increase in salary, it's going to result in a, a better quality of candidates for any open positions in the ministry. Um, they're all about improving the status of the colony. And keep in mind that these Anglican clergymen were already discomfited by the increase in religious dissidence, uh, even before the first Twopenny Act. So it's it's really not connected entirely, um, though there is some overlap just because of attitudes and how these acts kind of bring those attitudes to a head. And while they interpreted the act as um, a decrease to their salary, which I consider a stretch, they interpreted religious dissent as a threat to Anglican control of the colony. So th this is this is major for them. So even though the act wasn't trying to attack the Anglican church necessarily, and it didn't really decrease their salary as much as prevent them from taking advantage of other suffering, the clergy were desperate to maintain control uh, as much as possible or even better improve their status. And I certainly haven't seen them concerned about the economic impact of what was going on. They're, they're all concerned about themselves, not their parishioners. The clergy seem to have this sort of equation in their mind. And that works out to, you know, if they got more money, that equals being seen as gentlemen. And if they're seen as gentlemen, then that equals more respect from Father Virginians. Um, I think anyone who's read the Bible, knows that's not the approach Jesus would have taken. Uh, and I guess I'm feeling a little snarky at the moment. But I digress. It wasn't the first time that they had asked for a raise, either. Uh, not even in recent years. Earlier in 1755, the same year as that drought, uh, and before the Twopenny Act was passed that year, uh, they'd also requested a raise. And their petition was brought to the house by Peyton Randolph, who was a Burgess representing the College of William and Mary. And the House of Burgesses rejected it outright. There was just no sympathy for their plea, uh, which is really understandable, especially if there were already signs of that drought and they already knew there was going to be issues. And here come the clergy asking for more, right? Um, so then 1758 comes around the next year. And problems with crops have continued. It's not a drought per se, but they'd had enough problematic weather that this crop wasn't looking that great either. Um, so again, we have the increased tobacco prices, which are a threat for any bills that were typically to be paid in a certain weight of tobacco. Um, so Richard Bland, he uses the first two penny act as a template. He modifies it a little bit, and he presents it to the House of Burgesses so they can, again, try to relieve the burden on their fellow Virginians. Um, by the way, the Twopenny Act, you know, it's what we call it today, and, and it was called it casually after the fact, but the name that the House of Burgesses gave it uh, was an act to enable the inhabitants of this colony to discharge their public dues, officer fees, and other tobacco debts and money for the ensuing year. Yes, again, it's only good for a year, and then it expires. And again, it's not just the clergy that are being paid in tobacco. They are not the only ones targeted by this. Um, but as far as I know, they're the only ones who decided to make a fuss about it. This time, it wasn't Dinwiddie, it was Lieutenant Governor Fauquier who signed off on it. And that's just because of, the, you know, the timing of 
uh, their service in Virginia. So because of this timing, two different representatives of the king had signed off on these bills. Um, you know, I, I just want to point that out. I know the king would later say, well, you know, they don't have the authority. Uh, but if they don't have the authority, then what is the point of them in the colony? To cite historian Rees Isaac, quote, Although the acts were of wide application and affected tobacco payments generally, there are indications that there was a particular animus against the clergy, end quote. But why? Is this because of the previous issue between the, the gentry and the clergy, which uh, extended beyond or before the Two Penny Acts? Or was the issue because of how the clergy had responded to the Burgesses' attempts to provide relief to Virginians? Um, maybe it's a, a chicken and the egg argument, but I think that matters when we're considering their attitudes. Two pence per pound of tobacco was the same rate that they set for everyone else affected by the act. They didn't single out the clergy at that price. However, apparently the House of Burgesses had threatened to reduce the price for the clergy to only one penny per pound if they didn't stop whining about the act. So let's look at what I mean by that whining, right? Uh, one minister, Reverend uh, Jacob Rowe, he publicly talked about how many Burgesses should be hanged because of the act, uh, as well as stating that he would deny the sacrament, you know, communion, to any Burgess who supported the Tupany Act. And if you haven't seen my video on the Black Regiment, you may not know this, but I will state again that I thoroughly believe restricting the sacrament, essentially threatening the individual's immortal soul based on what they believed, um, Threatening that over political issues is just, it's too far. It's not right. Our immortal soul is a lot bigger than whatever is happening in this lifetime, right? That's, that's what the Bible would tell us. So you're going to threaten the soul over something that's happening in the moment that you just don't appreciate. Um, not to mention the talk of hanging the Burgesses, right? I mean, yikes. Roe ended up having to publicly ask the Burgesses forgiveness uh, for his comments. Now, the clergyman and the crown, they both ended up griping about these acts because they went into effect immediately rather than allowing time for the bills to be sent to London uh, so that the Board of Trade or the King or the Bishop of London could review them and have a chance to accept or reject them. Uh, obviously, the King is the one with this authority but the rest can kind of weigh in with their opinion. Of course, the Burgesses are like, well, look, getting a response from the Crown, that could take months, and Virginians need relief now. This was an emergency. And that's the whole point behind the Acts, right? That they this was an emergency. So this is how they decided to proceed, and they thought that it was acceptable because of that uh, nature of it being an emergency. And besides, you know, they're like, well, we did have approval in the form of the Crown's representative in Virginia, the lieutenant governors. Um, and, and we should be able to determine the internal workings of our colony. In 1759, so this is after both the Two Penny Acts had been passed. The Bishop of London, he wrote a letter to the Board of Trade with his views on the Two Penny Acts. Because even though they're expired at this point, the dust hasn't fully settled, he's gotten all these complaints, so now he's weighing in. And overall, he seems certain that it was this malicious attempt by the House of Burgesses to harm the Anglican establishment in Virginia. Never mind that most of the Burgesses are Anglicans themselves. Unsurprisingly to me, the bishop doesn't seem the least concerned about the wel welfare of, you know, Virginians overall um, that are Im impacted by these poor crops. And <sighs> the letter just seems like what you would expect from a leader of the Anglican Church who is parroting the complaints he's gotten from his clergyman in Virginia and not considering the other side of the argument. 
But in this letter, there is one paragraph that I found particularly interesting, maybe a little ironic. Quote, it is admitted that the maintenance of the clergy had the king's confirmation and that the governor, by his instructions, is refrained from altering it. But it seems the act confirmed by his majesty appointed 16,000 pounds of tobacco to each clergyman. The act upon which this advice was asked took no notice of the quantity of tobacco allowed to the clergy, but made it subject to a compensation in money, which was to be rated by the very persons who were liable to the payment of the whole. Upon this circumstance, the council gave their judgment and declared it was the opinion of the board that this bill was not contradictory to the law, insomuch as it by no means lessened the quantity of tobacco allowed the clergy, but only ascertained the price thereof to be paid in money for all dues, as well to officers as to the clergy. End quote. Um, exactly? I feel like the bishop is making the Burgess's point here on their behalf, whether he means to or not. They didn't change the quantity of tobacco that the clergy were entitled to. You know, that was what the king had set, not a value of it. Um, they just said that the sum could be paid in cash at the normal rates for tobacco. That's it. And this isn't the clergy's only income either. By law, parishes also had to provide glebes, land that could be used for farming, in addition to adequate housing and the normal salary for clergy. So the clergy could then choose to farm the glebes themselves, or they could rent it out and collect the money from renting that land. The money they'd receive for renting out the glebes that was a significant part of their income, and that was not affected by the two penny acts. Um, so they're getting that too. And it's worth noting, just you know, so everything makes sense here, that the Bishop of London, um, he's the guy who's, who has authority over the Anglican Church in Virginia. So all these clergymen, the reason that they're writing to him is because he's the one, you know, higher up in the chain of command. And I need to specify that the council that he mentions, uh, who thought this law was okay, that's the Council of Virginia. Um, so we're not talking about the Board of Trade or the Privy Council or anything like that. He's explaining the justifications of, of these various bodies in Virginia. Um, now, among those who, who wrote publicly about these acts were the Reverend John Cam, um, still determined to complain about the clergy's lot in life, as well as Colonels Landon Carter and Richard Bland, both of whom are in the House of Burgesses. Um, and to cite Rees Isaac again, quote, the sharpest anti-clerical polemics came ironically from two devout Orthodox churchmen, Colonels Carter and Bland, end quote. Now, I don't want to give the impression that this supports the clergyman's assertion that the House of Burgesses was just out to get the Anglican establishment. I don't think that's fair. Um, this was the reaction of Bland after he and his fellow Burgesses had taken measures that they believed were right for the colony as a whole, and I would venture to say many of them were probably shocked and disappointed by how the clergyman chose to respond to it. Um, so we, we could even refer to this as a righteous anger. And at the same time, it's only fair to acknowledge that there had been issues between parishioners and the Anglican clergy for decades. Parishioners resented that most of the clergy they were being sent were poor men from Ireland and Scotland um, who were willing to travel to the colonies to take up a position because they lacked better options. They resented that they weren't getting American-born clergy. You know, recruit some of our own, take them to London or wherever, train them, and then send them back to us, right? Um, did this contribute to the motivation behind the two penny acts? Um, I honestly don't believe so. I have seen people theorize, but I haven't seen anything that I think really justifies that conclusion. Um... Cam and his friends said that salary increases would fix all these issues. 
but would it? Would English gentlemen who were clergy in England, would they be any more likely to travel to Virginia just to get a little bit more money when they already had decent prospects in England? Would an increase in salary have anything to do with the Bishop of London getting Virginia some Virginia-born clergymen? I don't know that it would. Because I think if the bishop had been inclined to get American-born clergymen, he probably could have done that at the going salary. Like, he didn't need to incentivize that at all. Um, another issue here is with Colonel Landon Carter, one of the ones I mentioned who wrote about the axe. There was a situation in the 1740s where he had apparently evicted a clergyman from his parish and there were suggestions that it had all been because the clergyman, Reverend William Kay, had offended Carter. Kay says that Carter turns the vestry against him and Kay brought suit, where Kay won. Later, there was an amendment to the law giving every clergyman tenure from the moment they arrived in their parishes before they'd have to be received by the governor before they'd get tenure. Um... Does this reflect Carter's perception of the Anglican clergy in Virginia overall? I don't know. I don't believe that any clergyman after Kay had an issue with Carter, uh, but maybe we just don't know. And maybe there was one. I'm trying to be fair here. Um, but do you want to know part of the reason that Virginians just didn't value the Anglican clergy more highly? Among other reasons. They kept learning about the immoral behavior of various clergymen in Virginia. And that doesn't exactly make a person motivated to pay a premium for this clergy's spiritual guidance. In the 1757 case of Reverend John Brunskill, he had apparently committed so many monstrous immoralities that when Governor Dinwiddie reported the events to the Bishop of London, he didn't even want to repeat the actual details of what this guy had done. Um, but I'm sure fellow Virginians were aware. People talk, right? Um, and then it didn't help that, that fellow clergy, like Reverend John Cam, they invited Brunskill to preach in their churches because they thought that it was more important for the clergy to stick together and support each other than it was to deal with whatever indecent behavior was going on. Um, so... Depending on what that behavior was, that could have felt like a slap in the face to Virginians who were trying to live moral lives. At the same time, they're being told they have to pay for these Anglican clergy services. Most Virginians Anglican clergymen ended up letting the second two-penny act go as well. You know, they're like, let's, let's move on with our lives, right? But some persisted. Reverend James Morey was one who chose to take the matter to court. Thinking he could recover his supposed losses from the Tupini Acts, and I say supposed because as we covered, he got paid. It's not that they didn't pay him, it's he wasn't paid in an inflated cost of tobacco like he wanted to be. Um, he actually won his case because the king had rejected the two penny acts making the outcome seem straightforward to that particular court um but not every virginia court agreed there were two other clergymen who attempted to bring lawsuits um, and those cases they lost it wasn't until it came time for a jury to decide on damages for maury uh, that a young lawyer named patrick henry was hired to argue on behalf of the parishioners. According to Maury's account of these events, it took the jury only five minutes to return with a judgment, granting Maury the sizable amount of one penny in damages. And of course, Maury is offended. And not just because of what Patrick Henry said in court either, because you see, some of the members of the jury they're religious dissenters. And for an Anglican clergyman who felt that the established church was under fire, um, 
that was that was hard to swallow that you know the outcome was partially decided by these dissenters um but he absolutely took issue with the words of Patrick Henry as well, many of which he recorded in a letter to Reverend John Cam. You see, Patrick Henry couldn't really argue whether or not the law was on Maury's side. That had already been determined by the court. What Henry argued was more of an appeal to emotion. It was calculated to convince the jury that Maury wasn't entitled to damages regardless of what the law said. And to do this, he said a lot that was shocking for the time. Henry suggested that a king who would disregard legislation meant to help the people, quote, from being the father of his people, degenerated into a tyrant and forfeits all right to his subject's obedience, end quote. Certainly we have to allow for the idea and the probability that Maury exaggerated what was said in his letter. Um, but I also don't think that Henry was incapable of saying such a thing. He, he certainly was, uh, and very likely capable of worse. Um, and Henry also apparently targeted the clergy specifically. And he says, quote, When a clergy ceases to answer these ends, the community have no further need of their ministry and may justly strip them of their appointments, that the clergy of Virginia in this particular instance of their refusing to acquiesce in the law in question, ought to be considered as enemies of the community." End quote. This trial was essentially Henry's claim to fame, um, at, at the beginning of his career anyway. And, and this was a big deal not only for him, but it also sowed seeds of thought in the minds of Virginians that would impact future events in the colony. Now, make no mistake here, Henry was not the absolute defender of religious freedom that it might sound like. Um, he certainly did support freedom, but not the sort of separation of church and state that has become the tradition in America. He wanted to see a government that was still paying clergymen's wages. He just wasn't opposed to that, including clergy belonging to other Christian denominations as well. That's a topic for another video, though. Thank you so much for watching this all the way through. I hope you enjoyed it. Like I mentioned earlier, let me know your thoughts below, and I will see you all in the next video.